Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this Kaplan Masterclass on the secrets of marking wordy papers. Uh, my name is Andy Bradley, and I hope that everybody can hear me. If not, please just tap something into the chat panel and let me know. But uh, we have done a sound test, so hopefully everybody can hear me okay. I'm just going to share my desktop with you so that we can uh, go through a few slides that I've prepared. Okay, can everybody now see my desktop, my slide deck that I've got going there? If not, can you just let me know through the chat panel? And I'd also just draw your attention to the fact that um, my lovely administrator has already instructed you, if you want to get in touch with me during the presentation, please can you um, use the chat panel uh, rather than the Q&A so that um, we can just look at that section and also perhaps address your questions or comments to all participants so that we can all see them. Okay, so as I say, my name's Andy Bradley. I've got the, uh, the pleasure of looking out over a rather uh, dull and grey Leeds city centre today as I um, present to you. I hope that some of you are calling in from, from sunnier climes. Um, the object of this masterclass is to just give you some insight into how uh, wordy papers, as we call them, uh, are marked, uh, and also to give you some very practical hints and tips that you can think about bringing into your written answers to maximize your chance of scoring in a wordy question. Uh, and also, therefore, improving your overall mark on a paper. Uh, these comments obviously apply to those papers that we generically think of as wordy papers, so maybe um, audit or, or strategy or something like that, but also they do apply equally to any discursive question that you might get in, in any paper. And obviously, whether you're uh, studying ACCA, SEM, or whatever you're studying, many of the papers do have wordy questions in there. So these things do apply uh, equally to those. Just seem to be struggling to get my auto advance to work. Never mind. Uh, just a little bit about me then. Um, I am a tutor at Kaplan Financial. I've been teaching here for 17 uh, years, which makes me sound very old. Um, and I've also been a real exam marker for over 10 years for various institutes um, at different times, uh, marking different papers. But my specialities are in audit, strategy, and management accounting uh, from a teaching perspective. And uh, my marking has been across those three areas as well. So uh, probably marked getting on for 50 or 60 uh, different real exams over those years, which seems quite a frightening thought. Uh, but hopefully from your perspective, that means I uh, can pass on a lot of things that I've seen, a lot of insights into the marking process that you can then uh, turn to your advantage in your exams. So what do I want to cover in this in this session? Uh, in terms of the timing, I know it's advertised as a, an hour-long session. I doubt very much that we're going to um, take that long to get through the uh, the material. But uh, you know, it will take as long as it takes. And you know, if you ask me uh, lots of questions or want to know more, then you know, we'll gladly go on as long as long as you want me to. But there's three key things that I'd like to cover during this session. Firstly, just thinking about what you need to achieve. Uh, just gone on a bit farther. What you need to achieve when you are writing an answer to a more discursive question. So, what are markers looking for? How to get the marker on your side? That sort of thing. Then, although I don't want you to pick up on doing these things, I'm going to look at what constitutes a bad script because nobody ever thinks they've written a bad script. Uh, everybody thinks that their answers are adequate. And I'm just going to show you a few things that, if you'd read them yourself, you might have thought sounded OK. Uh, but I'm going to explain to you why they're not great from an exam perspective, and why they might not score marks, or they might not score enough marks to get that candidate to a pass. 
And then having looked at those generic areas, I'm going to give you some really practical hints and tips that you can apply going forward in your studies, not just when you're writing your real answers to an exam question, but in all those practice questions that you're going to do in your assessments and your mock exams before you actually sit a real exam. And that would probably be my first hint and tip, actually, before we move on, that once you've picked up on the things I'm going to suggest that you do, don't just think to yourself, oh, yeah, when I get into the exam room, I will do those things. Because everything I'm going to talk to you about is a skill. And like all skills, learning to drive a car, learning to write, anything, it needs to be practiced. And so you should be taking these hints and tips forward in every question that you do, either in the classroom or at home or in any practice exam or mock exam that you get to sit between now and the exam. If you apply them going forward, that means that when you get into the exam room, you will be doing them as second nature. You won't have to think, oh, I, what did he tell me during that presentation? What do I need to remember to do now? Because you'll be doing it anyway. You'll have practiced it and practiced it, and it will just happen. You've got enough to think about in that exam room uh, and all the you know, stresses that go with that without having to try and remember good writing practice. But if you can practice it right through now, then by the time you get in that exam room, whether it be in December or November or whenever you're going to sit an exam, you should be able to do it just like second nature. Okay, so what do you need to achieve overall in these working in these wordy papers? Now that first point I've made there, you might not see as being particularly relevant. I've said you need to make the marker's job easy. Now, what I mean by that is, although the exam processes are extremely rigorous, and the marking process is extremely rigorous too, in wordy papers, <clears throat> it is not completely objective. My computer seems to want to be getting through this quicker than I do. It's not completely objective in terms of whether something is right or wrong, and whether something deserves the full mark allocation or a part of a mark. So there is always going to be some latitude on the part of the marker to decide what mark to give you. And therefore, the marker is going to have to exercise some judgment. Am I going to give this a full mark, half a mark, or zero? Because many marking guides will say something like up to one mark per point. And so the easier that you make it for the marker to read what you're doing, to understand what you're trying to say, and to see that you have made the relevant point that is in their mark plan, it's going to be an obvious decision for those markers. They're just going to give you a full mark. They're not going to think to themselves, well, I'm not quite sure what was said, or I found it really difficult to read because the writing was not very good, so I don't feel I can give it a full mark. So I'm not here suggesting that you give the marker an easy ride. You know, They're there to earn their marking fee but they have got to make it very clear to themselves that you deserve a full mark every time you've written something. If you give them any excuse to give you less than that, then they're going to. And we'll look at how we can make the marker's job easy when we get onto the hints and the tips section. The next thing that I've put there is to make every sentence score. What I mean by that is that quite a lot of people are of the belief that to pass an exam, you need to write lots. And yet it might surprise you to find out that most examiners at most sittings tell us that the prize-winning script, the best script in the world, was actually shorter than the average length of script. What that means is that to be an excellent pass candidate, not only do you need to know your stuff, not only do you need to be able to apply that to a scenario, but you need to be an efficient writer. Too many people write far too much in the exam and therefore will find themselves under a degree of time pressure. As you're aware, that, the consequence of that could be that you don't finish the exam or you've rushed your final question, meaning that the performance on that question probably wasn't as good as it could otherwise have been. <clears throat> so 
Now, what I mean in this bullet point is not that you should write in bullets, not that you should write in shorthand, not that you should stop at a certain point and say, well, I'd better move on, but to make sure that you are not writing more sentences just for the sake of writing more sentences. The chances are that you will score the mark available for a particular point in the first sentence that you write about that point. The chances there are also then that anything you write subsequently about that point is likely to just be reiterating the point that you've already made. And sadly, a marker can only give you a mark for each point once. When you've scored it, you've scored it. Okay? So, again, when we move on, I'll be showing you some practical things that you can do to see if you fall into that trap and how to avoid falling into that trap going forward. But make sure that when you put pen to paper, you are actually saying something new, something you haven't already said in the next sentence. That does require, of course, that although you are going to feel under time pressure in most of your exams, you actually have to spend some time thinking and not just writing. We're all guilty of the fact that if we had a day to answer an exam, just like in the workplace, we'd have perhaps a day to write a report, we could tailor it, we could add bits, we could take bits out, and you don't have that luxury in a two, three, however long hour exam. But you shouldn't be afraid, despite the clock ticking, to have a think about what you're going to say before you say it. Not just, do I understand it, have I worked it out, but how am I going to phrase it? What do I need to write to make sure that the message I want to get across is the message that the marker will read? And you will feel that for every pause you have in that exam, you're wasting time if you're thinking about what you're going to write so that when you write it, it's better quality, that will not have been a waste of time at all. The next point, you need to add value with what you're saying. Now, this is very, very generic comment, and every exam varies. But simply copying out facts from the scenario and simply copying out your knowledge is rarely going to get you enough marks to pass. The nature of professional examinations is that you, they are training you to deal with a problem, whatever that problem might be. So simply writing out what I know is never going to be enough to get you a pass. Simply regurgitating the facts in a scenario is never going to be enough to get you a pass either. You need to do something additional. Now, what that additional is will, of course, vary paper by paper. It could be doing some analysis. It could be recommending a course of action in a strategy paper. It could be determining an audit plan in an audit question. But you must be able to show that at the end of your answer, the reader knows something or is better placed to do something than they were before they'd read your answer. Think about a strategy question, for example. I've marked a lot of strategy questions over my time where weaker candidates will simply paraphrase the, uh, the scenario that they've been given. Well, think about the reality of that if this was in the workplace. A client would have come to you and said, I've got a business problem. Let me tell you what my problem is, and then I'd like you to help me solve it. That's essentially what a strategy question is doing in the exam. If, for that client, you just wrote them a report which told them back what their problem was, but in no way helped them to solve it, I don't think they'd be very happy to pay your bill, do you? So we must be adding some value. You must be doing something the client couldn't do for themselves. Because if they could do it for themselves, they wouldn't have come to you. They would have done it for themselves. So whether that be analysis, whether it be pairing pieces of information together to create a more cohesive story, whether it be giving some instruction or making a recommendation, you must show that you've done some of that. And then the last thing on this particular slide, application, application, application. If you're attending a tuition course somewhere, you are probably sick of hearing your tutors using that word at you, but that's with a, a, a very good reason. 
That's because if you read the examiner's comments in any exam at any sitting, somewhere you will find the examiner saying that a lot of the answers that they read, the ones which were not pass answers, could have been the answer to a different question. They were very generic answers. Now, one in the early papers of any qualification, knowledge does get you a lot of marks because they are knowledge-based papers that you are being tested on what you have learned. But once you get beyond those early papers, as I've mentioned already, knowledge is not going to be enough to get you through. So you have to be able to tailor your knowledge to that question. Again, try and keep it real. Tailor it to that client, to that problem to that scenario. And it's this application that students always come to us and say, I've learned a lot of stuff, I've learned the textbook page by page, I know everything in this syllabus, but I'm not sure how to apply it to questions. So, three things to think about. Putting this application into your answers isn't always as difficult as it perhaps sounds. Now, you might think that what I'm about to tell you is it can't possibly be true because it's so easy, but believe me, it is. You can show that you are applying your knowledge to a question by simply using the company name in that question. So, for example, I was in the classroom the other day and I set a question about Porter's value chain, which is a topic many of you may have studied or be studying. And the question was something along the lines of explain how a company could use the value chain to assess their competencies. And when you looked at the model answer, remember this examiner, that, this answer that the examiner has written, pretty much line by line, the marks were given for saying things like inbound logistics, this looks at a company's raw materials and how a company buys them, stores them and gets them to the production line. Well, that's almost just a definition of inbound logistics from the model. But they've made it applied by using the company name. A company should do this. And it went through and did that for all nine activities in the value chain, and that's how people applied it. So use the company name. Use the characters in a question. So, again, across some strategy papers, you may well have had to study leadership or structure. You could make your answer applied to the scenario by using the characters. James Brown has adopted this management style. The manager of the marketing department seems to be following this sort of structure, rather than just writing out what you've learned from a textbook. So that's not too difficult, is it? We can get the application map by saying, I know there's a scenario. I have read it and I have understood it. Another way that we can do it, the second way for application, which is why I've written application three times, is refer to facts in the scenario. If on your read-through of the question, it's led you to think about something you want to say in your answer, then refer to that point in your answer. So going back to my previous example, if you've decided that James Brown is adopting an authoritarian management style, because you've read in the scenario about the way he has treated an employee, you could put in your answer, James Brown appears to be adopting an authoritarian management style as evidenced by the conversation he had with this other employee. So that shows the marker that you've read the scenario. You haven't just gone to the requirement and said, oh, it's about management styles, so I'm going to write out everything I've ever learned about management styles. And you have got the reader to understand what you're writing in the context of that company, in the context of that scenario. So although I've told you back up in my first bullet point, don't copy out chunks of the question, bringing in salient, relevant facts from the scenario to support your argument is an excellent way of getting those application marks. And then the final way to get application in is to solve that company's problems. Nobody in a company is ever going to come to you as a strategy consultant, for example, and say, tell me about Porter's generic strategies. 
They're not interested. They're not academics. So if you're using Porter's generic strategies in a question, it must be to help that company understand whether it is a cost leader or a differentiator or whether it has become stuck in the middle. So just writing out a generic list of why would you want to be a cost leader, why would you want to be a differentiator, is not going to help that client at all. You need to look into the scenario and say, well, what, what are you currently doing? Why isn't what you're doing currently working? I am going to make a suggestion for you. I'm not going to tell you what Michael Porter generically told everybody in a theory. I'm going to use that theory to guide you to make a decision to help improve the performance of your organization. So hopefully, you can see the purpose of application three times. Three reasonably easy ways of getting application into questions. Just to remind you of them again, use the company name or the character names where you can. Refer to the facts of the scenario to support your argument. And make sure in any sort of problem solving or advice giving question, you are solving that company's problems. You're not just writing out some generic prescription that you've read in a theory. I'll tell you another very good example of that last one. If any of you uh, have studied or are studying papers that have the Boston Consulting Group matrix in it, so maybe ACCA P3, uh, CIMA uh, E2, something like that, um, or even E3, we know that the Boston Consulting Group matrix gives generic answers to what you should do with a problem child, a generic answer with what you should do with a star. But what a weak answer would do in a question is where you've identified that this company has a problem child product is to just write out that prescription from BCG and just say you've got a double or quits decision. Either invest or get out. Because that's not tailoring it to that company's issues. You're not looking at the position of that problem child in that company's portfolio. So you just need to make sure you're taking your knowledge and making it company specific. Has anybody got any questions so far? Because I see that the, the chat panel's gone a little bit quiet, which is fine if you're all happy. But uh, you know, please do type anything you like in there if you want me to give any further clarifications as we go through. No, everybody seems okay at the minute. That's fine. Hi, Carol. Um, you missed the first 10 minutes. Um, don't worry, because we will be sending out a recording uh, to everybody. So you uh, you haven't missed it. You're just not getting to see it live. Uh, but you will get the chance to, to see it afterwards. You'll, you'll get it emailed to you. OK? So if we move on to the next slide, what constitutes a bad script? Now, of course, this comes with a huge health warning because these are the things that I don't want you to do in the exam. So please be careful how you remember these things. These are the things I don't want you to do. And I have touched on some of them already, but here I'm just trying to get a little bit more specific for you. So firstly, I've written there vague comments. What markers, my computer is very eager to finish today, isn't it? What the markers are not allowed to do is to assume what we think you meant to say. These exams have to be rigorous. And if we were allowed to assume what we thought you were trying to say, people would get marks for things they've not actually said. So sometimes we do read scripts and think, I bet they meant this, or I think they were on the right lines. But unless you've said what's in the mark plan, we can't give you the marks. And sometimes that is what happens. People write a comment very, very vaguely. Not, I don't think, because they don't understand it, but because their writing skills are letting them down. And the way that I always talk about this to my students is for all wordy papers, if it was an oral exam, I think the pass rates would increase massively. Because if you said something in a vague way, the examiner or the marker that you're in the room with would have the chance to say, can you just expand on that? Can you just tell me a little bit more? 
or I'm not quite sure what you mean, can you say it a different way? But sadly, it's not an oral exam. You have this once and once only chance to write what you're thinking. And sometimes I think things go a little bit wrong between brain and hand from what you're thinking to what you end up writing is not actually the same thing. So all comments have to be as specific as they can possibly be. Now, one um, way to think about this, and I apologize to anybody who's not studying auditing, because uh, this is a slight audit example, but when I'm teaching um, auditing, which I do quite a lot of, and we're talking about audit procedures, think about, you know, if, if you're not studying auditing, an audit procedure, the word procedure means I'm telling somebody what they have got to do. I tell my students that they have to think about a young man called Little Johnny. Because little Johnny, I tell them, has just joined their audit firm. In fact, today is the first day little Johnny's been at work, and he's never, ever studied accountancy or auditing before. So when they're writing out their audit procedures, I tell them they've got to imagine they are telling little Johnny what they want him to do. And so when they've written their audit procedures, I ask them to read them back to themselves and say, hand on heart, from what you've written, would little Johnny know what you want him to do? Or would he be confused? Because if you honestly think you would be confused, then you've not written that test, that procedure properly. You've not been specific enough. So some things that students in audit questions like to write would be things like, I would discuss it with the directors. Imagine telling that to a young lad who's just joined your audit firm on his very first day. Go and discuss receivables with the directors. How stressed out is that lad going to feel? You've not told him what you want him to discuss. You've not told him any questions you want the directors to be asked. And you've not told him why he's having that discussion. So how is he going to know how to start the conversation? All because you knew what you wanted to discuss with the directors, but you didn't write it. My least favourite word in auditing, I get very stressed when students write this word, is that I would vouch additions. I would vouch a transaction. Vouch is an awful word. Nobody can show me what the word vouch means. If I ask students to explain the word vouch, they do it by telling me another word, a different verb. Oh, I actually meant I'd look at the invoice, I'd add up the list. If that's what you actually mean, say it. You know, vouch hides ignorance. When we see students saying, oh, well, on additions, I would vouch them, we don't give them a mark. Because what does vouching mean? I have no confidence that if I presented you with an invoice that you would know what to do with it. So you've got to be very, very, very specific in what you are saying. Think about what is your idea, what is your thought, what do you want to convey, and make sure that you convey it. Next point. People tend to rely on technical terms. So again, I'm going to give you an audit example here. The problem with relying on technical terms is that they often, again, hide ignorance. So those of you that are studying or have studied auditing, you will be aware of the financial statement assertions. And in many an audit exam, you get a knowledge question that says, identify and explain four, five, however many, financial statement assertions. So as many of you will know, one of those assertions is called existence. I wish I'd got paid for every time I've had to mark a script where somebody has written existence means it exists. Now I'll just give you a second to absorb that. That was meant to be an explanation. Existence means it exists. I can almost hear some of you laughing as I say it. There is no way that that was ever going to get the explanation mark. They've got the identification mark for having learned that one of the assertions is existence, but it means what exists? Where does it exist? When does it exist? What, what do you mean? So a good answer to that would be existence means the asset or liability exists in the company at the balance sheet date. You've got to write more, but it guarantees that you're going to get that, that particular mark. So sometimes, as I say, people just write out technical terms, which is fine if the question is state or um, list or something like that, but not in an explain requirement. You've got to use your own words to make sure that somebody understands it. And I'll give you one 
um, very useful tip here on how to make sure that you don't rely on technical terms. With my students, I always get them to think about a very special person, my grandmother. Because my grandmother was the most inquisitive person I've ever, ever met. It was almost impossible to tell her something and for her to just say, thank you. She would nearly always come back at you with, what do you mean? You need to tell me again, explain it differently. So I tell my students they need to think about her in the exam. Read their answers back to themselves and say, would Andy's gran have understood what I've just said? Or is she likely to be coming back at me saying, what does that mean? Or I'm still confused. So, for example, if we had some sort of strategy question that was about Anzos matrix, a weak answer would just say, well, your uh, possibilities, your opportunities are penetration, product development, market development, or diversification. Because my gran wasn't an accountant. She's never heard of diversification or market penetration. She doesn't know what they mean. So just dropping those terms in is not going to help her. Therefore, it's not going to get you a mark. I think sometimes students in wordy papers assume that the person who's marking it is an accountant. Well, the chances are they will be, because that's who the institutes employ. But you've got to assume that your audience is not an expert. Think about presenting to a board of directors. There's probably only going to be the finance director who's got financial understanding. So you can't expect all those other directors on the board to understand the technical terms that only us as accountants have learned. So you've got to, in explain requirements, use layman's terms. Make sure that somebody who's not an accountant can understand what you're saying. Over regurgitation of facts, I've covered that, I think, on the previous slide uh, when I said about adding value. If all you do is tell the client in the question what they already know, because they've already told you, then you're not going to get any marks there. Not answering the question. Now, there's a few areas where people go wrong here. Sometimes, again, I think it's because of time pressure, students rush reading the question. And what you often find is there are several questions within one requirement. So I'd like you to do this, comma, this, and this. There's actually three things in one sentence. And if you rush, you may only pick up on one or two of those things, and you are automatically then limiting your mark to two-thirds, and that's if you do a perfect answer. So you must, however much time pressure you're under, read the requirement, read the requirement, and read the requirement again. Make sure that you have picked up on however many parts there are to that requirement, and that you've really understood it before you go on. I'll give you a real-world example of that, and again, it's an audit example. But, as many of you will be aware, in most auditing exams, if you get a question on the audit of payroll, it's often to do with uh, the systems and controls over the payroll process. One time, we had a question that wanted you to come up with audit procedures to do with the audit of payroll liabilities at the year end. So things like the PAYE and the national insurance owed to the tax authorities, the last week's wages that you'd not paid. So it was really a question on liabilities. But we had student after student after student who was writing things like, I'd observe people clocking in. I'd make sure the timesheets had been approved by a manager. None of which was relevant to a liability at the year end. But people had just read the requirement quickly, picked up on the word payroll and procedures, and trotted out all the procedures that they have uh, learned elsewhere. So make sure that you read the question requirement very, very carefully. Linked to that, I've put missing the verb. Many students think that all questions begin with the same word. Do. Do this. Do that. No question ever starts with the word do. And the institutes, I would perhaps say SEMA in particular, extremely concerned about picking the right verb for a requirement to test a particular level of skill. If you miss that verb, you're going to have the wrong slant in your answer. So on a simple level, 
things like state or explain requirement, uh, sorry, state or list requirements tend to mean there is a lot of things that I want covering, but I don't want any of them covering in great detail. So the chances are you're only going to get maybe half a mark per point, so you need to cover lots of points. Whereas an explain or a discuss or a describe requirement is a much higher level requirement where there is probably fewer things that need covering, but each of those things needs covering in much more detail. So you may be able to get a mark, a mark and a half, maybe two marks per well-explained point. But if you just write lots of points out in, with no detail, you're just going to clock up half a mark every time where two marks were available. So you must make sure that you've read and assimilated the verb that's being used. It should dictate how many points you're going to try and cover in your answer and the level of detail that you need to try and cover for each point. The next point on there from a bad script, brain dumping. Picking up on a keyword from the requirement and telling the marker everything you've learned about that particular word, that particular area of the syllabus. We don't get questions like that. I've never seen a requirement that says, tell me everything you know about a topic. Again, one of the key skills accountants need to learn, and that's what the exams are there for, is to take what they know and apply the relevant bits of it. So people often write stuff which is completely unrelated to the question in the hope that by showing they've learned something, they're going to get some marks for it. They're not going to be able to do that. Just see, I've got a question here from, uh, from Vicky. What's the difference between discuss and evaluate in your answers? As in, how should you attempt a question with the verb discuss or evaluate? Vicky, very good question, and thank you for that. Um, it does vary a little bit exam by exam, um, but discuss, we could think of as talking around something, so um, telling me the salient facts about it, talking about the pros and the cons to some degree, but making sure that perhaps it's, it's a bit like an explain plus, so making sure that we understand the answer, uh, we understand the problem better as a result of your discussion than at the beginning of it. Whereas evaluate would take that just a little further by still discussing the pros and the cons, but reaching some sort of conclusion as to, I don't know, whether A is better than B or whether any of these should be uh, taken forward. So much more of a, a conclusion or a ranking perhaps needed in an evaluate question. Whereas discuss might be set out the issues and let somebody else decide. Hopefully that's okay for you there, Vicky. So just back to, um, back to brain dumping. The other problem with brain dumping in the exam is that you would overpower the client. You'd be telling them far more than they need to know. And again, they're not going to think they've got good value from, from you. From your perspective, brain dumping, of course, means that you just run out of time in the exam and you're not giving very, very focused answers. It also means that you've probably not read the question properly either. Um, again, a little example to try and illustrate that for you from an audit perspective again. Uh, we once had a question about um, for some procedures on a company's non-current assets. And it told you in the scenario that during the year the company had bought some trucks and it was the first year they'd ever owned their own trucks. Before that year they'd always just rented some trucks when they needed them. And you were asked to come up with some audit procedures on the trucks. And we had thousands of candidates in that real exam who included tests like um, compare the opening netbook value to last year's closing netbook value. When it had clearly told you in the question, we didn't have any trucks last year. On the depreciation side, people wrote, make sure that the um, depreciation charge is consistent with the prior year. Again, we'd not owned any trucks before. There was no prior year depreciation. But people had just learned a list of tests on depreciation, and they were determined to copy them out, determined to tell you stuff, even though it wasn't relevant to that question. There are no extra marks in marking guides for you adding things that it might be brilliant that you know them, but if they're not part of the question, you're not going to get any uh, credit. Um, question there from Clive. Thanks, Clive. To what extent would the examiner try to read the handwriting of a student? 
well, I can I can categorically answer that, having marked many thousands of scripts. Um, we have to do our best. Now, that doesn't sound like a very concrete answer. Um, we certainly are not allowed to just say, oh, I can't read it. Since they went on to, uh, for some institutes, computer marking, we do have the benefit that we can zoom in, uh, and that often helps. So we are expected to do our very best to, to read the writing. Um, but if it is completely illegible, then we forward it to the examiner who has to make uh, an attempt as well. And if not, they will forward it to the exam body and say, do you agree that we just can't mark this? But that would be very rare. The problem, though, with people with bad handwriting is we often have, end up guessing what you've written. And therefore, we could potentially miss something that was worthy of a mark because we didn't think it said what you thought it said. So although most students are sort of too old to change their handwriting a great deal now, I always say to my students, if your handwriting is bad, then there's a few things that you can do. You need to firstly carve up your time differently to the average student. You need to spend more of the exam time writing so that you can write more slowly. Because most of us can write neater if we write slowly. So if you are somebody who suffers from bad handwriting, try and make sure that you get the thinking and the analysis done quicker so that you can allow more time for writing and write slower. Also, depending on why your handwriting is bad, some people have very loopy writing. Um, if that's the case, I always suggest to people that they only write on every other line so that the loops don't get in the way. Uh, and although it takes longer to do again, maybe write in capitals because capitals are usually easier to read than handwriting. So there's a few things that can be done, but please take some solace from the fact that we do have to try and read it. Um, but I don't want to give everybody carte blanche to think it doesn't matter if my writing is appalling, they'll have to pore over it forever, uh, because there does come a point where we would have to give up on that. Is that okay, Clive, I hope? Um, next point, no analysis. Now, a lot of wordy questions, so I'm moving away potentially here from wordy papers, but to wordy questions, are where you've had to do something with some numbers and then do some writing to back those numbers up and to do something with them. So let's just think potentially about something like ACCA paper P3, where you've been given some historic numbers and you have to analyze the performance of a company, or you've maybe in audit got some numbers to do some analytical procedures on. And this is where examiners regularly comment that students' analytical skills are not very good because they see the numbers and they think, it's just about me calculating lots of ratios. And as long as I can do that, I'll be fine. Well, actually, you won't because the marks are, for the calculations are likely to be quite minimal. The good marks are back to this adding value concept that you need to do something with the numbers. And a simple approach to that in such an analysis question would be to cover three things. What, why, and so what. So the what is doing the calculations and telling me what's happened. So um, the receivables days have moved from 35 last year to 65 this year. Simple, easy marks, but not many of them. Why is suggesting a reason that that could have happened. And this is where people start to let themselves down because they say, this means people are taking longer to pay. Well, we know that. That's the definition of receivables days. What we're looking for here is, why might that have happened? So suggestions like, maybe we've taken on some new customers and we've offered them extended credit terms. Maybe there is a recession and our customers are struggling to pay. That is where you're adding value. And then, so what? Why does this matter? Why is this relevant to anybody? So that could be where you would say, if this continues, the company is likely to face cash flow problems um, as it's got to pay its suppliers before its customers are paying. Or there may be a need uh, for bad debt provisions in the, in the accounts. So you can't just get a lot of marks by saying, here we've got uh, a calculation, and I'll explain the calculation to you. It's why might that thing have happened? Why might something have moved? And then, what are we going to do about it? Why is it important? Shinola, hopefully I pronounced your name uh, OK there. What's the difference between a discuss and a compare and contrast question? Um, not a lot in some cases, um, but it might be only one thing that you have to discuss. So discuss the merits of building a factory in China. So you're only talking about 
um, the pros and the cons of that one thing. Compare and contrast tends to be where you are looking at two different things and you are looking for the similarities and the differences between them. So compare and contrast um, opening a factory in China or buying that company in Brazil. So what would be the common things that would happen if we did one versus the other? How are they different? As opposed to discuss the merits of building a factory in China. So you might only have one thing to discuss. Compare and contrast tends to suggest there are two potentially opposing, but two different things that need to be looked at. What's similar, that's your compare. And what's different, that's your contrast. Okay, hopefully that answers your question there. Last point on this slide, and then we'll move on. No conclusion. I think students in exams are very, very frightened to conclude in case their conclusion is different from the examiner's. Well, I'm here to tell you that in most exams where conclusions are required, what you conclude often doesn't matter. The marks are for showing the skill of concluding. So especially in an evaluate question, but in other types of question as well, it will be expected that when you have delivered a well-rounded argument, the pros and the cons, you will make a decision or you will make a recommendation to a client as to what you would do. And in all fairness, given that students are scared of them, they're often easy marks because what you will get in that conclusion is the opportunity to simply go back over what you've already written, decide which you think are the most important points, say them again, and use them to justify whether your answer is yes or no, or project A or project B. And as long as you can justify your conclusion, if you think they should do project A, but the examiner thinks they should do project B, you will still get those marks. Because nothing in business is so black and white that we'd all get the same answer. We're all going to have different views on things. And therefore, you will be throwing away a lot of easy marks in things like evaluates if you just present the facts and then walk away. Because the client is still no clearer as to what they should do. You need to help them by suggesting that. I call it sore bottom syndrome, that students end up with sore bottoms because they sit on the fence all the time. You need to get off that fence, decide what would you do on balance given the arguments you've put forward. Which side of the fence you end up on really, really doesn't matter. So the last two slides have looked in quite general terms about what we need to be trying to do and what we should be trying to avoid. What I want to do on the next slide, the next, and which is the final main slide, is turn that into some practical things for you. Practice, practice, practice. Now, I know that question practice is dull. I hated it as a student. I used to love just sitting in class, listening to my lecturers, and then when it came to doing the homework, I was bored, stupid. But I'm afraid, no pain, no gain, you will never get better at writing answers to exam questions with all of those things we've just talked about unless you practice doing them. And as I've said, you don't want the time to be putting these ideas into practice to be in the exam, on real exam day. You have got enough going on at that point. This should come as second nature. So please take every opportunity that you can to practice questions that you may be given for homework or out of exam banks, uh, question banks or practice assessments or mock exams because the more you practice doing these things, the better you will get at them. Next thing, how will you know if you are getting better? Well, the next few points are going to cover that. Read your answers back to yourself. Now, this is even more boring than doing the question in the first place, but it will provide you with massive value. Because when you're writing answers to questions, you're just busy thinking about getting what you've thought on paper as quickly as you can in the time. You don't really have the opportunity in live question practice to assess the quality of your answer. So I would recommend every time you do a question, when you've done it, go and have a, uh, a little break and then come back and just read your answer to yourself. Is it in good English? Does it make sense? Do you even know what you meant to say when you read it back and you've had a chance to forget it? Does it sound like a professional accountant has written it? Is it getting across the arguments that you hoped it would? Because if it's not, then what you were thinking while you were writing it isn't how it came out. Now, none of us is perfect at writing answers, and we'll all have our own things we're not very good at. 
But unless you read your answers back to yourself, you won't know what those things are. So you won't know how to improve going forward. Rewrite them. You're all going to hate me because I'm telling you to do the most boring things in, in, in life. But when you've had a go at a question, have another go at it. When you've read it back to yourself and you've realised where you went wrong, where it didn't read very well, where it didn't get the message across, have another go. Put into practice those things that you've learned. Now, I don't know how many of you who are listening are car drivers, but this is no different from how we're taught to pass our driving test. We get in a car, we drive it. The, exact, the instructor says, how do you think that went? What do you think you did wrong at that junction? Why didn't you manage to park the car the way I asked you to? You think about it, what do you do next? You have another go. You practice doing the same thing again until you get better at it. So rewriting your answers is very, very valuable. When you're reading them back to yourself, you're going to have to review the model answers, which I've written further down, which again isn't the most exciting thing in the world. But what I want you to start doing is then compare your answer to the model. Or if this is an exam you've submitted to your training provider and you've had some feedback, see where you scored the marks and cross out in a big red pen all the areas that didn't score you any credit. Because that's going to tell you whether you are one of these people who writes too much. Because what you might find is that you get a, a tick or a mark or whatever your mark is using at the start of a paragraph in the first line, and then you kept writing and writing and writing, and the rest of that paragraph didn't score anything. Now, the chances are that's not because what you wrote was wrong or was rubbish, but there was maybe only one mark for that particular topic area, and you scored it in your first line, but then you kept writing. And there was nothing more the marker could give you. So cross out everything that doesn't get credit, especially if you're finding that you're one of these people who's perhaps running out of time in exams or in questions because you're writing too much. Next suggestion, read your peers' scripts. So if you are attending a course, swap answers with your friend because you probably looked at your answer when you wrote it and thought, yeah, that was a good answer. You get it back from a marker and you scored 40%. Maybe. You've no real idea at this point why your script wasn't up to the standard. But your friend who you sit next to in class, they might have scored 70. So if you read their answer, you might be able to learn why their answer was better than yours. Similarly, they might have got a really big shock to find that they got 70%. They might have had no idea that they'd written a really good answer. By reading yours, they might be able to see the difference. Now, this is obviously a little bit sensitive. We don't want any of you going into your classroom saying, hey, I got 90%, who wants to borrow my script? Or saying, did anybody get a really bad mark? I'd like to see why mine was so brilliant. But if you're good friends with somebody in your class, then you should be on a level with them where swapping scripts is going to be mutually beneficial if it's done in a sensitive way. Compare your answer to the model. This is the dullest thing in this entire list. But... In a numerical question, so maybe if you're studying financial accounting, you can very quickly whiz to the back of the question bank, look at the balance sheet and say, yep, I got that number, I must have got it right. You can't do that in a wordy question. And all too often, students will skim read a model answer and say, yeah, I roughly wrote that. I was on the right lines. Well, you don't get marks for being on the right lines. You get marks for writing what the examiner had written into the mark plan. So I'm afraid you do need to spend, and in my recommendation, as long as you spent doing the question, going through the model answer and comparing what you did to the model. Did I really write that? Was I thinking that, but I didn't write it like that? Did the examiner go to a level beyond my answer? How could I learn from that so that if I get a similar question again, I will write better, more, less, different angle, whatever? But if you can't see what the examiner wanted because you haven't bothered reading the model answer, you won't change your behavior. You won't do anything different next time. And then, just because I think they're really great people, think about my gran. So that, if you remember, was the explain stuff. Have you actually got your message down on paper when you're reviewing your answers or when you're writing them in the first place? Or are you just relying on some technical terminology to get you through? And think about little Johnny. Remember, your audience isn't meant to be other accountants. You can't assume they know what you mean. You've got to spell things out. 
you've got to convey your message clearly, you've got to make sure they understand the relevance of every sentence that you have written. All too often, if I'm going through a script to the student, I'll say, well, what does that mean? And they'll laugh at me and say, well, you know what that means. You, you taught us it. Uh, yeah, but I'm not the audience. I'm not the person reading your answer. You've got to be aware that they're not accountants. Question from Clive there. Is it possible to get full marks on a five-mark question with only writing two paragraphs? Um, I can't get too paper-specific, Clive, but the obvious answer to that, I'm afraid, has to be yes, because you could write two very, 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 very long paragraphs that contain within them everything that's needed to get a five-mark question right. Um, if you're telling me that your paragraphs are only a couple of lines long, then two two-line paragraphs, I should imagine, is very unlikely to ever score five marks. Uh, but it depends how much you shove into a paragraph. Um, I, I tend to prefer to help students by thinking about sentences rather than paragraphs. Um, it's very rare that a sentence could ever get more than one mark. So if you can think about it like that, you won't go too far wrong if you think that a five mark written question is likely to need five sentences at least that say five different things, not the same message written five different ways. But it's very unlikely that any one sentence is going to get you more than a mark. So maybe it'd be more useful for you to think along those lines than about paragraphs, because paragraphs are as big or as short as we want to make them. You're, you're very welcome. OK, guys, we're getting towards the end of the hour now, and it has taken uh, an hour, which is great. Oh, another question. What's your recommendation on time management versus the number of questions? Uh, I'm not entirely sure that I understand the question there, uh, Devi. Um, but a, a, a quick answer to that question would be stick to your time allocation. In any exam, you can work out how long you've got per mark. Um, so if it's a 100 mark exam and you've got three hours, you've got 1.8 minutes per mark. You must stick to that. So the very first thing to do in such an exam is to say, right, if this is a 20 mark question, I've got 36 minutes to do it, and I will give up after 36 minutes, and I will move on. The problem students have there is they often, as soon as the invigilator says you can start, they'll read the question paper, and they'll see there's a question coming up that they don't really like the look of, and so they'll think, OK, well, I'll spend a bit longer on all the others because I don't think I'm capable of doing a very good answer to this one question. That's a really bad approach. What you need to do is give each question the time it deserves, leave lots of space between questions, and then if you do get to the end and you find there's a question you don't like, you don't take very long on it, you can then go back and spend more time on the others. But at the first attempt, you must give each question that number of minutes per mark per that exam. Chinolo, how come on beef up their exam technique? Um, basically, the stuff on that slide that's still on screen, Shinolo, um, these are the things I go through with my students. You can't do it by making notes. You can't do it by reading the textbook. You can only do it by practicing questions and exams and then applying those things that I've talked about during the last hour. And when you've got a question back, going through the things on that particular page and learning from the process. The students who do exams, practice exams, and never look at them when they get them back, I, I sort of laugh at people like that because I think, how are you ever going to change what you do? You'll just approach the next exam the same way. So lots of practice and lots of review. Vicky, if we were to write six sentences for a five-mark question, would we read through all six? Um, I'm afraid that depends very much on exam by exam and institute by institute. Um, some exam boards would say that um, if they have told you to um, make five points, they'll only mark the first five. Some exam boards would say that to their markers read all the points and mark the best five. But if it was a five mark question, it doesn't necessarily say five sentences. That is just my rule of thumb that a sentence is not going to score you more than a mark. Where we do get issues is if the question says identify five whatever, then in some institutes they would only mark the first five. In others, they'd look at all the ones you wrote and mark the best five. But this one mark per sentence, I want to be very clear, is just me giving you some guidance. It's not a rule in the exams, but a sentence is unlikely to score you more than a mark. OK, so in conclusion, three things. Be clear. Vague answers are one of the biggest reasons that people fail. 
Be specific. Don't write generic answers. Tailor the answer to the company, to the problem, to the person in the question. And add value. Don't just don't just um, regurgitate the facts from the question. Otherwise, your client, in reality, would wonder why they're paying your bill if you just tell them what they already know about their company and about their problem. Okay, guys, um, that's it from me. If you, I'm going to stay online for a few minutes, so if anybody's got any more questions for the next few minutes, please still type them into the chat panel. Um, I hope you found that useful. And wherever you are in the world and whatever you're studying, the very best of luck in your next and future exams from me. Uh, and my email address is on the bottom there if you've got any questions about um, marking and things like that going forward. Okay? Thank you very much. Thanks, Emma. She would have been very pleased to think people were thinking of her.